Welcome. It's just turned 7.15, Wednesday the 10th of November, and you are watching episode 29 of Regional Wrap. Regional Wrap, providing an insight to the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, when saving the planet comes to destroy your environment, are my guests Ken Kerry and Stephen Naukowski. Both Ken and Stephen were presenters at a recent Keep Columban Wild uh, information night in Cairns to highlight the impact of regional energy projects on the natural environment. Ken is a concerned resident of Ravenshoe community, who ran for the 2020 Tablelands Regional Council local government elections. While Coranda resident Steve is an avid and active environmentalist and renowned wildlife and panorama, panorama photographer. Welcome, Ken and Steve. Hello. Hi. Hi, Bill. Yeah. Hey. Thank you. I'm Thank glad you, you joined us. me tonight. Uh, well, I'll start with you, Ken, if you can just give us a bit of your personal background. And uh, you're obviously not a native of Ravenshoe. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, so you can give us a bit of an idea of your journey to get there. Yeah, sure. Um... I uh, arrived in, I was born in Glasgow in Scotland and I arrived in Australia on the 10 pound cruises in uh, 1969 uh, and then returned to Scotland in 1976. Um, on completing school, I joined the Royal Navy uh, where I served 12 years and then met my beautiful wife in London. Uh, she was a backpacker and I was a sailor. so. It was a match made in heaven and moved out to Australia uh, with my daughter and my wife um, in 1995. In 1996, I joined the Royal Australian Navy and spent the next uh, 17 years with them, where I uh, specialise as a hydrographic surveyor um, using uh, multi beam echo sounders and survey equipment at sea, but also LIDAR in the air. Um, when discharged in 2013, uh, I had already bought a property in Ravenshoe and I moved up here permanently. And I've been here since 2013. And um, yeah, since then, I've really taken to the community and uh, I do volunteer work around there. And basically, I've just fallen in love with the area and know that this is the place for me. The survey ships sort of came out of cans, wouldn't they, at that time? They were. Yes, they were. Uh, yep, I served on uh, uh, HS White, or hydrographic um, ship White, which was one of the three crews. I commissioned HMAS Melville, and uh, I worked uh, with the LADS flight, laser airborne depth sounder flight, and, yes, yeah, spent pretty much my whole career in Cairns working on the Barrier Reef and the Torres Strait. And you didn't manage to hit anything? Uh, no. <laughs> like our border force? <laughs> well, I did, uh, I did do, um, I did do uh, border operations for uh, approximately four years uh, just after the Tampa. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm no longer in the Navy anymore. Um, medically discharged uh, after that in 2012. Okay, we'll move on to Steve. You give us a bit of your background and... Uh... We'll find out where you're a native of, or, or, or <laughs> yes. another, another blow in. <laughs> yeah, well, well, obviously, Dad's Polish, hence my surname. <laughs> and uh, But I was born in Bankstown, Sydney, and grew up in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. And uh, when I was about 16, my family decided to move to Brisbane into suburbia. And so we moved there, and I did my final two years of school there. And then I went uh, to Queensland University of Technology and did an, an associate diploma in cartography and ended up in a, in a very, in the same field as Ken actually in hydrographic surveying at uh, the Port of Brisbane. So I was a draftsman there as a, as a hydrographic drafts person. And then uh, um, uh, I, I always had an, a, a deep love of the natural world. And uh, I discovered a place called Hinchinbrook Island off the coast of Cardwell and uh, I just wanted to move closer to Hinchinbrook Island. So I g gave my job up in Brisbane, moved to Cairns and got a job at the Cairns Port Authority doing the same sort of work as a hydrographic surveyor slash drafting. 
and uh, and I haven't looked back. So I've been up here for about 24 years now. So I was there for about five years and then moved away into photography and publishing as a career. Uh, so as I, as I was out bushwalking and camping and, ex and exploring new places, I was out photographing and writing stories and eventually brought out a number of books about different natural areas of North Queensland. Uh, my first book was actually on the Hinchinbrook Island campaign, um, which I was involved in back then. And uh, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, so photography has, has come from that. Photography has always been integral for me in terms of natural history, nature, uh, the natural environment. And I seem to get embroiled in environmental campaigns um, because I feel so passionate about environmental campaigns and I suppose there's a saying called ignorance is bliss and sometimes I wish I was just ignorant because <laughs> uh, the more you know the more well for me anyway the more I know the more I get passionate about issues and uh, sometimes I wish I was just ignorant sometimes but yeah. anyway and you get involved and your time gets eaten up and yeah. you don't get on with your, what your primary love is but, yes. uh, you ha have to have to devote your time to these sort of causes um, yes. if we just move on to uh Last Thursday night and the meeting there, uh, you both had spoke at that event. How how did you all connect with the other speakers and the uh, uh, the forest uh, forest people, uh, forest Australian forest rainforest reserves or something, wasn't it? The, the yeah, right, right. Forest reserves, yeah. yeah. So how how did you all connect? Um, yeah. Probably better if I start, Stephen, um, um, but because. I think we all came together because um, of the Caban project, the Caban Green Power Hub. Obviously, you know, we have connections from before that with different people, but I think when the Caban Green Power Hub uh, physically started working, uh, or physically started it, um, uh, there was a few phone calls made and I basically, I cried out for help for any like-minded people. And then it was a case of, I know this, person or this person or this person and uh, it sort of came about that way so it was a it was a, a natural evolution of people who were uh, desperate to save the environment from what is going on but sort of what we were disparate people not as well as desperate but it, we finally came together and I think um, yeah that's that's pretty much how it happened and then Chalumbin came up and so on and so forth. Yeah, Ken, Ken's actually been quite integral to my story because Ken called Carolyn from Rainforest Reserves, I think, and showed her and sent some photos to her of the destruction that was occurring on the site. And then Carolyn called me and said, hey, Stephen, there's Ken out at Ravenshoe and these are the photos. Do you know anything about it? I said, yeah, yeah, well, I, I know that that project is in the pipeline because a mate told me three years about it, three years ago, he told me about it. And the fact that there was this, you know, really critically endangered frog on the site and he wanted me to go and photograph it, which I never did. Um, so it all came together. So I'd heard from someone else, there was a, a, a you know, really rare frog on the site that needs to be photographed and identified. Ken had called Carolyn, Carolyn called me and, uh, and I decided to call Ken. Ken, what's going on? <laughs> Yep. And that's how it started, yeah. yeah. And, and you caught, got a photo of this frog, I believe. Well, I, I don't know. No, I'm no, actually going out Saturday missing? night. I'm going out Saturday night to look for the frog. Mm. Yeah. So it's still missing in action. The female is, yeah. We know nothing really about the frog. We don't know what its habits are. We don't know where it goes in the day. We don't know what the female does. We don't even know what the female looks like. So in, even in this day and age, there's amphibians out there that we don't even, haven't even discovered yet. I suppose the, I suppose the big thing, impact really, is that um, but all this has been driven, of course, by climate change, which is a different topic all, altogether. You know, I mean, you can be, you can be like myself. Uh, basically, you'd call me a denier. I don't have a problem with food emissions. Um, and then there's other people who are passionate and then that passion really is striving the renewable energy bandwagon, if you know what I mean. But I don't think a lot of people have 
perspective in regards of how big this bandwagon is when you come to replacing baseload power. So I'll just start off and I'll just share a screen in regards to some of the projects that exist and some that are going to come online just in regional Queensland. So I'll just share a screen now. The screen up there is at the moment is just our area. You've got Palm Cove in the north and you're just going down to Tully and Mission Beach. And basically you've got uh, the uh, Emerald Wind Farm and you've got a couple of planned uh, solar projects up there as well. Uh, of course, you've got the old Barren River Hydro. Uh, in, in the white down below, that, that's Emerald. Uh, no, that's not oh, Emerald. Be, yeah, that white, that's Caban. That's Caban. So is, that's not completely operational yet, but is oh, it? Sorry, that, sorry that, that could be Caban. Uh, it could be High Road, actually. Or Windy Hill, is it? Oh, yeah. Well, no, Windy Hill. I think that one's a small one, Windy Hill. It's only about 12 megs. Then you've got Caban and uh, then this is, this is uh, that's Columbus right. just down the bottom here. Yep. But basically what you've got is you, you've got this proliferation. And as, as you mentioned the other night on, in, the, uh, in the information nights, yes. it's basically all to do to hook along the transmission line. Because yeah. as, as you said, it costs, the further you're away from the transmission line, the more it's going to cost uh, the supplies, the connection. Now, this is Queensland, mm. central and north Queensland. And it's just one big mass, and not all, none, only about a third of these ones are actually operational at the moment. The rest of the plant, but you can you can see what we're in for uh, in the future. And so uh, we've got issues where we are now, but it's got to come to the doorstep of many, many more communities as as time progresses. Mm. So I think I think that's the thing that people have got to realise the the proliferation of these things that are going to occur and actually the massive footprints they actually have as well. And I think that's what we're going to just touch on now in regards to both Caban and uh, Columban in regards to uh, their footprints and especially in regards to uh, access uh, pathways for uh, getting into the actual uh, sites for the towers and and the rest and the transmission lines uh, so yes a lot of people thought oh well it's just a it's just a pile on there a pile on there and so it's a, no big deal but what people are obviously do forget is through natural wildness they're actually ripping up huge roadways and breaking the continuity between one area and the other um, and I suppose because so many of the Images uh, like you get from England and even other wind farms is it's just on open country like across farmlands, so it doesn't have this doesn't seem to have that impact. But now where we're talking about in our in Australia, so much of that um, wind farm um, projects is actually in native forest or in bushlands and that. And I think one of the biggest coming up is a bit, bit worried down near Bundaberg, which is, is, a, is a huge project and it is basically in, in a whole forest area. So that's, that's, a, that's a big, going to be a big problem for them down there. But if we just come back to um, Caban and, and to Columbus, <laughs> if you can give us a bit of your impressions in regards to A, the footprint, and then the actual construction or, or, or the roadways before you actually get the construction of the, uh, of the wind farm itself. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, well, I can go first. Um, I've, I've got a little bit of a history because I documented the Mount Emerald wind farm when that went up. And uh, back then I was uh, a, a very, very keen supporter. I was very enthusiastic, as were most people in North Queensland with Mount Emerald. Uh, we thought that, that was going to be um, uh, our contribution to the renewable industry when you combine that with the existing Korea hydro, Coomba Loomba hydro, uh, Lakeland Solar, um, Windy Hill, 
you combine all those and we'll, we'll we, you know, we pump about enough power for about 150,000 homes. And I thought, well, that's, you know, we're punching above our weight in terms of the renewable output that we are in North Queensland are putting out there. Um, and with Mount Emerald, I remember I've walked all over that site and it's, it was a beautiful site. It was a, a remnant piece of vegetation with one of the last great viable populations of Northern Quolls. And, uh, and, uh, and I saw the, the turbines being built. I photographed the haulage roads. I was gobsmacked at the amount of devastation that those haulage roads put through the landscape because it's just not haulage roads, it's transmission lines it's electrical substations, it's concrete batching plants, it's lay down platforms, it's workers, dongers and accommodation areas. So there's, it's, it's really a full on industrial landscape. And, but, I, but back in the day, I thought, well, that's the price you pay for renewables. You know, I was happy to sacrifice Man Emerald and that's it. And then along comes Caban and I know how brutal the land, the, uh, the industry is. It's a very brutal industry, the wind industry on the landscape. And then when I saw what was happening at Caban and the amount of vegetation clearing, and then what they've got to do then is bench all the roads, quarry out the turbine sites. Uh, it blows my brain with, in terms of how much heavy earth moving need is required. And then you think, okay, well with Caban, we're set with renewables. <laughs> but, then you, but, then you, but then you think, well, Shalumban is off the charts again. And it was only two weeks ago I found, just by chance, I was putting in a submission with Shalumban and I found the Upper Burdekin project. And the Upper, Pro, Upper Burdekin project, no one knows about. It went through local council, state government. It's now federal government, listed as a controlled action. And if it, if it wasn't, if I didn't stumble across it, I don't think anyone would know about it. And this is twice as big as Shalumban. And it's, it's off the charts. So what's happening now is there's this ring of steel right around the western perimeter of the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. Um, and I, I, I sympathise so much with the local communities at Ravenshoe, Tamulan, Caban, um, Atherton. Um, and I can tell you now, those communities at Miller Miller, Melanda, Atherton, their day will come. They, they will get turbines put up around their suburbs and their, their communities. And uh, I don't know where it's going to end. And, and uh, the amount of land clearing involved is off the charts. I've estimated, I've worked out, I've looked at, there's, there's 12 projects I've researched in, in, here in North Queensland. And I've determined there's about 20,000 hectares of classified remnant vegetation to be cleared for those projects. So uh, it's, it's just a bizarre, it's a bizarre scenario where we need to reduce our carbon footprint, but the very things that sequester carbon, which are our native forests, are being bulldozed in the process. I think, I think the other thing is people... I mean, I think Mount Emerald was only about 30 turbines or something like that. Yeah. Uh, Caban, I think that's up to about 95. No, no Caban is 28. Only 28, okay. And yeah. Lumban is... 95. 95, okay. Yeah. Um, the ones at Jalumban will probably be the bigger ones, probably 3.75 uh, megawatts. I think they're about the largest one uh, onshore ones at the moment. Mm. Um, the offshores can get up to 10 megawatts, uh, but they're, they're huge again. Um, but uh, maybe Ken can just touch on the sheer scale of the, these things. Oh, it, it is just incredible. Um, when you look at Mount Emerald, uh, I believe they are 230 to 240 metres high. Um, the ones that are going into Caban are roughly 250. Uh, the ones are talking about Chalumban are 300, basically. They're the next generation. Uh, we just got word, uh, it was in the paper today, our Cairns Post and the Table Lander, that the blades are 80 metres long and they will be arriving in the Port of Cairns uh, next month. 
uh, and they'll be there for 18 months while they transport them up up uh, through Cairns. So if you don't think it affects you, just think of this, 28 turbines, three blades each, 80 meters long. Then you've got the, the actual hubs themselves, uh, the nacelle. Uh, you also have the towers that they have to bring through. So they will go along um, from the, the, the port of Cairns down through Gordon Vale, Edmonton, or Edmonton, Gordon Vale, all the way down to Innisfail to the Palmer, uh, Patterson Highway, and then up the Patterson Highway and past Miller Miller, and then uh, transported through Ravenshill and then out to Caban. 80 meters long. That is a lot of length and 25 tons. Now, when you think of Windy Hill, it's 46 meters high. 46. The very first wind, uh, I won't call it a farm because it's not. It's an industrial power complex. A farm is somewhere that actually, you know, has value to the local economy and to the people. And it is land. Whether it's cleared or not, it's land. Uh, these things are, yeah, 46 meters high at Windy Hill. And then we're going to have all these massive industrial uh, mm -hmm. turbines. Uh, dotted around the area. Now, the effect on everyone in the region will be, you know, one of those breaks down on the Palmerston Highway, that's that's the highway closed. And that did happen with the Mount Emerald ones. Uh, one broke down, the highway was closed. So in actual fact, it, 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 it's the, econ the economics of the area will suffer as well. Um, and, and obviously the, the road and all that sort of stuff. But... Um, to put it into context, when you look at Windy Hill, they had a few uh, environmental issues and all that sort of stuff. They actually uh, lowered the amount of turbines. Now, Caban is, was 29 turbines. It's now 28 turbines. And uh, it's very interesting to know where that one disappeared to. Uh, no one seems to know. However, um, it does seem that w on the very first uh, meeting we had with the company that runs it, uh, in November 2017, um, they were told us that it was only they were going to be 150 meters high. That's all, 150 meters, and had all the fluffy pictures and everything. Um, but what they didn't tell us was the haulage trucks going through the centre of Ravensall every day, approximately 200 for the last three months since they started. Um, so it's that it, it's that <laughs> impact as well. So it's, a, it, it's difficult to, to explain how high and how tall these things are and how, um, how they impact on the visuals of the area. But all I can say to you is, um, Stephen said something to me really interesting today, is um, uh, the, the ones at Chalampan are going to be 300 metres high. From sea level down in Cairns to Karanda, it's 350 metres elevation. So... If you were to look up from, you know, down in Cairns at the waterfront, these things are enormous, absolutely enormous. So, yeah, that gives you a sort of size. Uh, well, look at the size of Q1. It's as tall as any, as the tallest building in Australia. And we're going to have 28 of similar size in Caban and 95 at Chalumban. So, you know, that, that sort of explains the height of them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the other, it, it's, it's not so much the turbines themselves. It is the other consequences of the actions taken in the, in the industrial sites that have me particularly concerned. One of the other things that's very interesting about the whole thing is how fast they get approval. Like we had a Dani, a coal mine, and I mean, um, whatever your thoughts are on coal, but I mean, they dragged out that for years and years on the basis of one, one bird and a few other things. But these things just get the royal pass. Now, isn't that sort of concerning in regards to how well or how well the, the system is sort of making things easy for these these projects um 
especially when they're not really wealth creating, they don't really do anything. They might supply some electricity that some rent seeker will get, but it doesn't really add wealth to the community. Um, but it gets the royal pass so fast. And really, a lot of people are a bit late on the scene into getting to realise what impacts they're, they're going to have on their communities. Is that one of the things you notice, you know, in particular, Stephen Ken, that these things just sort of mention one day and they're the next sort of thing? Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely gobsmacked at the speed of these developments. Mm. <clears throat> um, I've never seen anything like it. Um, I'll give well, two examples. Well, Upper Burdekin, for example, which is the one that I stumbled across just two weeks ago, that obviously had gone through local council, had gone through the state. It's hit the federal government and the environment minister. If there wasn't threatened species on that site, it would have got approved, done deal. And no one, no one would have known about it. The other one that came to light purely from me just happened to be looking through the Mareeba Shire meeting minutes. I, I live in Mareeba Shire and I went through the minutes and I saw a, an, an, an agenda item for this Desailly Solar Park. I thought, what's this? A solar Park in Mareeba. So I clicked on it and there was a 200 page document about this big solar park, 2,400 hectares in size. And the CEO of Mareeba Shire Council approved it under delegated authority using the superseded planning scheme and it went straight through to the state. And I went through that document trying to find how much land was going to be cleared because I know that country pretty well. And not nowhere in that document did it say how much land was going to be cleared. So Peter Franks, the CEO, signed off on this $1 billion project without even knowing the extent of how big that site was. <laughs> and this is the lunacy of it. And I've, I've got to laugh. You know, it's just, so it's, uh, it's just insane. And I, I feel very sorry, like I said before, for local communities like at Ravenshoe, who, have, who are completely powerless to, to have any meaningful input into these projects. The Integrated Planning Act is geared towards renewables and you find that the local planning schemes are favorable for renewables. And then when you get to state level, the State Environmental Protection Act is exempt for wind farms. So it doesn't even go through. So for example, I wrote a letter to the state government um, why did it go through? Their response was, well, they never saw Shalumban go through the process because it doesn't go through the Environmental Protection Act. Um, there's, it, I can't, I just, this is just bizarre to have a huge, like Ken said, a huge industrial complex that can be, be potentially built hard up against residential communities and there's no legislation, there's no policy framework there's no mechanisms for the community to have any meaningful input into the direction of their livelihoods and their lives and their homes. Yeah. 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 Just on, I'll just break it, jump in there, but it, it is quite ludicrous. Like we've got a government that jumps on farmers and graziers if they want to cut down a tree or clear some old growth and things like that, you know, and basically they read them in the right, right act and they do a thing wrong, they get fined, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and threatened with jail. Yet, <laughs> and, and the thing is, you've got, I mean, I don't know what your stance is, but you can't all possibly believe that every farm is a vandal or whatever. I mean, they do things out of necessity or, or, or their or need, but you find it sort of inequity between a wholesale industry getting a, a clear road and yet someone who's managing the land to produce income, the benefit, the benefit of the community like a, in the farmlands, the graziers or, or growers, has to jump all these hurdles. I mean, it, to me, it's just, just outrageous. Bill, it, it's absolutely, it, it's insanity. Um, at Caban at the moment, uh, where they've cleared all the roads, you have farms that go all the way along Condon Road, uh, which leads out to the industrial site. Um, 
I know the farmers out there. And uh, there's dairy farmers, you know, horses, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I was talking to my mate, who's uh, a butcher, and they run their cattle on, on the local land around Ravensall. And if he was to chop down a tree on his side of the fence, he'd be fined a lot of money, probably, you know, hammered in the with jail. Yeah. Probably threatened with jail, yes, um, because it all comes under land clearing laws and all that. So he can't chop down one tree, but on the other side of his fence, he's got a 50, 50 meter wide stretch that has been completely stripped bare and padded down with gravel and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so it's in, it's absolute insanity. And, and I must tell you, it's in the last, uh, since last Thursday, um, Ravenshall is in a feeding frenzy, an absolute feeding frenzy of corporate raiders and people trying to make a buck out of it. So much so that um, I, had a, I had a friend of mine who had uh, property on the market and the real estate agents were saying, oh, can you take videos so we can send it to people? Or who do you want to send it to? Or someone in Melbourne. Well, why would they want it? Because this person is very proud of her land, has animals on it. You know, it's quite quite a vital little area um, where she has, you know, beautiful trees, all that sort of stuff. And um, and they said, oh, we want to send it to them. And said, well, what are you going to do with it? Uh, are you going to sell it? And they said, oh, no, they want to buy it because then they can rent it out for $800 a week to the contractors. And she went, well, I'm taking it off the market <laughs> because we're getting two or three people each week going down to our community center saying the person that owns the house is selling it because they can get like triple the rent, whatever. And they can triple the prices that they paid for the house in the first place. And what is happening because it's a transient workforce, these promise of jobs and jobs and jobs is uh, an absolute fallacy. Um, what's happening is the contractors are buying the houses and they're, sitting there six seven eight of them in there because they're almost drive in drive out and you can't you know uh, so they're going to take these homes for about the three or four years work that's going to sit in the area in the meantime we're losing our younger generation because the banks have got them over a barrel because you can't buy a house in Ravensall, the township itself unless you have a 25 percent deposit so if your average house price is 200000 which it used to be, you need $50,000 in cash to be a deposit. Outside of Ravenshoe Township, in places like uh, Millstream, Innit, uh, Tumulin, all those sort of places, it's 40% deposit. 40% uh, percent deposit to buy a house. So the younger people in this area, because we are a lower socioeconomic area, can't afford to buy it. And the people that have bought them have or have, do own homes are selling them for enormous amounts. Um, to give you an example of, uh, of how much money they're making is the median house price of homes in Ravenshall went from 185000 last year, or sorry, 180000 last year to 235000 this year. So... That's a huge jump in anyone's book. Now, some of them are, I describe as COVID refugees coming from the cities to move to, to rural areas because they're sick of what's going on in there. Now that's fine, that's fair enough. But, but the problem with that is that when they came up here, they bought on the understanding that what they were getting was what they were getting. None of them, as far as I know, were explicitly told that that property you bought, your views are now going to be taken up by an industrial complex, turbines as far as the eye can see. And by the way, you're going to go through three or four years of roadworks and then the upkeep from that for the next life of the, of the turbine. So they're they are absolutely spewing. You know, they thought they'd come to this idyllic, beautiful little uh, town, historical town, and now they find out they're going to be living in a big industrial wasteland and, and work site. So 
it's it's extremely depress uh, distressing walking down the street and, and and talking to people about this and and when they talk about jobs that you'll see every single company that puts these industrial complexes ahead saying it's all about jobs it's going to create 250 to 350 local jobs well that isn't quite true um what like i said it's a transient workforce so you'll have almost like three groups of, of workers you'll have the what I like to call the dis destructive side. So they go in and clear the land and uh, they move on to the next project because the irony of this thing is basically you can't work in, a, in one of those projects unless you have worked in one of those projects. So the piecemeal stuff that the locals get is, you know, haulage, things like that. And, and, None of us in the town begrudge anyone making a quid. We don't because we're we're dark poor up here, basically. But you know, and the local businesses do employ people, but only in that first stage. Because when the second stage comes, which we're now at at, at Caban, is that a new crew takes over, and that is the transport and construction side. So they are the ones that come in, put up the towers, put on the turbines. And then after that, you get the people that set it to work. So they will move from one project to the next. Now, when I say it's a feeding frenzy in, in Ravensall, well, some smart guys are going, well, look, these are getting passed, you know, no problem whatsoever. So Caban was the basically, oh, no one protested. No one really seemed to care. Um, right, that's it. We're going hell for leather. And that's how we ended up. Now the high road just reignited its, um, or, 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 or um, uh, put up their website to say, oh, we're doing the high road now. And we went, well, hold on a minute. You haven't even got permission off the land landowners in that area, but they don't care. They're going to go ahead with it. And then you, and then you have Chalumban. And then you go further on down to Mount Fox and, and further down to the Burdekin. The communities that are going to suffer are some of the, the poorest and, uh, you know, areas in, in North Queensland. Um, and I don't, I don't think people quite understand the devastating effect, uh, effect that has on the morale of people and, and, the, and the living standards. And talking about jobs and the economy booming and stuff like that. Yeah, some people are making money. Not many. Not many. And that's only for a temporary time for them. And talking to the local business owners, they're actually not making much money off the contractors. They'd be better off with a, a booming tourist trade. They'd make more money that way because the contractors are supplied everything out at their dongers. And even the ones that live, that have bought the houses to live in for this temporary time, they're drive in, drive out. So they're either working or they've gone home. So there isn't there isn't an economic boom at all. And, and like I say, the 200 trucks coming through town puts off the tourists. It's dangerous for our people, for starters. I'm, I'm absolutely amazed that no one's been hurt uh, in the town. But there seems to be no economic benefit to the local residents apart from we'll set up a community fund. Now, the community fund's all good and well, um, and those that take it, you know, you can't blame them. They're trying to help their community, the, the organization they work for. But when you're talking about the, you know, 10,000 here, 20,000 here, when these projects are costing up to a billion dollars, it's, it doesn't make sense. And when they leave, when they've erected all these and all that, our bills will be higher. We know that from the experiment in Canberra with 100% renewable. But us poor buggers up here are left to pick up the pieces. We'll, our, our tourism industry will be destroyed. Our environment will be destroyed. Um, it, it, it's one of those things that until you actually see it, you would not believe what is happening here. And, and as Steve says, and as you say, we feel powerless. I mean, I've been fighting these for four years, and I knew the tactics from day one because the company – basically put out the PR statement that I was the only opponent out of a room of 60 people because I was the most vocal. So you can see the tactics. Just, just on, on this jobs uh, front, do you think, like obviously the state state government's just 
you know, the free pass. And the only, the only sort of first first part you get got a chance is with the local council. But because they think or or there's jobs in it or something in it for them, they they don't overly go into it either. So do you think um, that's the stage you need to get involved in in the very, very first part is as soon as it's at that council level to get stuck in and try to make your case there to the, to the local government uh, before it gets a free pass by the state government? Because it, it does seem that they're most, most local governments, and this is the problem with all of them, they're so desperate to get something in their area to say we've got development that they'll basically sell their soul. And like, like Stephen mentioned in regards to that um, solar, solar uh, project in, near Mariba, it just shifted through and basically, it's basically because the local governments are so intent of at least getting something in their area and giving themselves a pat. And that, is that how you see the jobs front, Steve? Yeah, well, local councils Australia-wide are pro-development at any cost. Um, the only exception I can think of is Douglas Shire, uh, Byron and Noosa to some degree, where they've actually got some sort of social policy and an environmental policy on the rollout of uh, um, development across the Shire. But I think every other Shire in Australia, they, they'll, they'll sell whatever they can to uh, to get to, to get to get what they assume is jobs into the shire but like ken was saying there is no jobs there's no long-term meaningful jobs out of these projects um yeah so <clears throat> i think council uh yeah council just see this as a as a as a a, a great way to get a billion dollars into the shire but it's not a billion dollars it's actually um, you're actually destroying the very thing that people come to see the Shire for, which is tourism and its natural assets. Um, so <clears throat> I think council, the council, particularly Tablelands Regional Council, Mariba Shire, well, all councils that they're really, they really need to understand what the industrial renewable energy sector is like and what the consequences and downstream effects of those are on communities. Because I think we're going to see a lot of issues going down the track, like Ken said, with devaluing of valuation of uh, land prices. That's the other thing, you know, councils will potentially bring in less, less rates from the devaluation of land <laughs> from these projects, <laughs> um, you know, because their rate base is based on the value of property. And if property goes down, they'll, they'll receive less rates. Um, but there's, there's issues. Um, there's psych like psychological issues. I, I couldn't think of anything worse than having turbines there in the distance 24 seven. Um, yeah, and knowing what the damage it's doing to things like birds and bats and the ecology. Um, yeah, anyway. But yeah, yeah. Um, and also Bill, um, I, I, uh, I ran for mayor of uh, Tablelands Regional Council and uh, uh, the reason I did that was not um, I mean, obviously I was in it to win it, but that was not the primary reason. The primary reason was to be given a platform across the tablelands to talk to people and tell them what was coming. And, and, and I suppose a lot of them were like Steve, you know, with his early years. Oh, yeah, we're doing our bit. That's fine. But now the reality is here and they see what is going on. They are furious and horrified. And I must admit, not one single councillor or, or, or candidate mentioned any of this except for myself, <clears throat> which is really interesting because most of them are, you know, were, were going for their job back again. And I, I just found out that, you know, the first thing we knew about Caban, for, uh, for instance, was when the company that was uh, that is going ahead with it held an information meeting. And we went, who are these people? Not one single thing was mentioned by council. And like Steve says, he managed to come across a document that he found that, you know, from Mariba Shire Council, but for Tablelands Regional Council, none of us knew about this. None of us until this company came in and said, we're having an information day. And then, 
you know, floated the idea with pretty pictures, told us it was 150 meters high, blah, 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 blah. The usual sort of PR stuff. And it, it, it was, it, I was astonished that no one knew about this when it actually happened. And, and it was literally, they turned up one morning and just started digging. That That's the first we knew about it and hence my phone calls. None of us knew when it was starting, what was going on. It just happened. It literally happened one morning, six o'clock, boom, done. No one knew about it, not even the people that lived there. I think one of the other things is uh, sort of may astound people, like they, they present these things, oh, it's going to supply 150,000 houses uh, of electricity. But what they're really saying, it will, it will power 150,000 houses some time of the day, maybe, or, or whatever. It depends on how much wind's blowing and, and all the rest of it. But it's, it's an intermittent source. Uh, it's, it's, it's a real problem, basically, to the grid. Um, and the other thing is people don't realise how many of these things you need to, to replace base load power. So, like Steve thought, well, Mount Emerald, well, that's fine. We were, we, we've got our, we've done our share sort of thing. But all of a sudden there's one, two more, and then there's more on the way. Well, just how many of these things do we need to actually, you know, do the job? And how much is it going to cost us to get our power from them? Um, so is, is that surprising to you uh, both in regards to how many projects are in the wind? Um, and uh, are you astonished? Well, how come we need, you know, 29, 30 wind farms right down the coast and then probably more than that? How, how profitable can all these things be and how many are we going to end up with? Um, have you got any idea in regards to what you think in regards to how many we're going to end up in just in Queensland alone? Well, it's, it's, a it's a tough one to answer, but one thing I can say is um, the people around these industrial complexes don't make a, don't make a cent. It actually sends them backwards. Uh, the, the social uh, upheaval, uh, the welfare services that are at break and stretch. So if you look at the economics of it, um, the people that are making money out of it are foreign companies. Um, basically, um, the company that wants to run uh, Chalumbin is... They employ 20 people. They physically employ 20 people. It's on the website. Uh, just go and look at it. They're, they're basically the guys that tick and flick. And then they sell on sell it to whoever they want. And because it's gone through the environmental rules or not, because you don't need to adhere by them, um, you know, they, they're getting people like the Danish uh, are invested in it. Um, three of their seven projects that they've had up um, so far it were sold to Chinese investors. Now I don't know about, I'm, not, I'm no economist in foreign interference and security laws but if you imagine that that's just one that I know about and we know there's going to be so many of them, it's the things we don't know about. The subsidies that we pay are very generous in this country and so like I say it's a feeding frenzy from every corporate shark around the world that is just coming in here and saying, well, we can make money even if we're not providing electricity. Because the irony is that the only way they can provide that electricity is if the taxpayer bills them the transmission lines and grid to put it in. So we have to build that ourselves, the government, whilst paying them subsidies and they're taking it all offshore. So nothing's reinvested in Australia there's no jobs. Those 350 jobs are 350 one day, 350 the next. They're not, they're not accumulating. It's 350 jobs until the next project. And it's still 350 jobs. So there is, there is big corporate money out there. And, um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I, they won't be paying tax because we're subsidizing them. So what is the economic benefit versus the actual amount of power, this is, this is what I'm wondering. What is the economic benefit versus the power costs and 
the cost to the, the, the taxpayer themselves. I can't answer that, but I am extremely worried about it. Um, as you see Mount Emerald, they're never turning. Everyone says they never turn. So why are they viable? Who's making I think the, money? the other thing you might be missing there is hmm. although on the project stage they're entitled to grants, but the other thing you don't really yeah. hear about and is those confidential feeding tariff feeding uh, commitments that the state government give, and that's the state that government. The what they what they basically are saying is whether the wind turbines turn or not, we will give you X number of cents per kilowatt, even though you're not producing Absolutely. it. So, so I think that's one of the problems. And because of the, that confidentiality, uh, we'll never know that detail. The only thing well, we indicated can. you'll we ever can. get is in your, pro, in your electricity price somewhere along the line. Well, but maybe we can, Stephen we can this actually gauge that, Bill. Yeah, sorry, Bill, but we, we can actually gauge that uh, because the ACT is a perfect example. They've, they tout themselves as 100% renewable. That's true, even though they have an extension cord to Victoria and an extension cord to New South Wales, which is basically an extension cord to, uh, to coal fire power in, in Queensland. But what's happened there is, as you say, it's confidential how much they pay a kilowatt hour. Now, they keep saying the cost of renewables is going down. Yes, that is certainly true. You can look up the AEMO site any day and see that. However, when it comes to your bill, so think of this, the ACT government is subsidizing the turbine companies not to turn it, not to turn the blades or not to provide electricity, but they've guaranteed them a set price for the life of that project. Now, if the turbines go down to say a dollar a kilowatt hour because they're producing electricity for us and it's going into the grid, the ACT government's already promised them $3 a kilowatt hour. So who's picking up the tab? Well, the tab goes to the end user, which is you know, most, mostly business, but in this case, mostly public servants. So we're paying it down there. But in a case like this, if the same thing happens up here in the north, um, oh, I must, I must say as well that not only are they subsidizing the companies and paying this amount to them, but they're also subsidizing the bills that the domestic users get and the business users get. So it's like a never ending money tree that the, rate, that, that the taxpayers and the ratepayers are paying out. The same thing happened up here. We don't have public servants on the table land, very, very few. We don't have a place like Canberra that has extraordinary high wages on the, on the taxpayers' purse. We have people that are struggling. So this is a death knell for every small town along this transmission line. It, it, it will absolutely cripple them. So, you know, it's not rocket science, it's complete insanity. Yeah, well, look, I, the, out of the 12, the 12 projects that I've identified for the Tablelands, the cumulative cost for that is $9.4 billion in capital. I, you know, I, I can't get my head around that figure when that infrastructure only lasts 20 years and then it has to be replaced. So we're going to spend $9.4 billion on solar and wind and then the turbines need to be decommissioned and either recommissioned or... And there's another big capital outlay and I, I just... The sums don't, don't add up for me. I, I can't work it out. I just don't know. And I know I the subsidies... Yeah. Sorry. I think, I think the other concerning thing is this on selling of projects. So what happens eventually, it passes along the chains to so many uh, owners that by the time we get to the 20 years, we might not have a clear definition of now who's responsible for, for um, decommissioning or is only or the person responsible is only a $2 company. That's you can right. never fund it and just says, well, I'm bankrupt anyway or whatever and leaves the taxpayer. Is, is, that, is that on the cards for us? That not only do we have to, A, provide subsidies and then B, guarantee tariffs, and then we have mm. got to be hit with the cleanup bill. Is, yep. is that on the cards for us as well? I mean, do, do people know what we're getting into here? Yeah, I think it's inevitable. You know, so for... It costs around $560,000 per turbine to decommission. And when you extrapolate that for Shalumban, just say they want to shut that down after 20 years, that's going to cost $52 million. So 
Uh, and what these companies do is you'll have their parent company and then you've got the Shalumban Wind Company, Shalumban Wind Proprietary Limited, Caban Green Energy Hub Proprietary Limited. They're all the $2 shelf companies. Um, they can very well easily go into liquidation, receivership, administration, and leave the community with the mess to clean up. And I, I think it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the good old taxpayer. Yep. You know, is, is yep. er, everything about this, it, it has nothing to do with the market. It's all driven by the fact that the governments are so gullible that they've, they've committed to this and we're going to pay. Um, I, I, would, I would sort of ha have some sort of appreciation for it if, if it was a solely market-driven thing and the money's all coming from private investors and and there was no no impost on the taxpayer other than being cheap electricity. Um, but that's not the case. And no. I don't see it changing. Well, we'll see what happens with uh, Windy Hill because it's the oldest um, industrial turbine site in Queensland. It's coming to the end of its life. We've already seen one on fire, which um, which I, I, I showed at the meeting last Thursday. So they have to be decommissioned. Now, they don't make 46 meter turbines anymore. So uh, what are they gonna do with them? Are they gonna take them all down and rehabilitate the area? Or as is already explained, they're gonna go ahead with Windy Hill one and two which they'll replace those turbines because like I say, the feed in frenzy for our money and our subsidies and they, I, I, I can see it inevitably, you know, they'll put up another, you know, there's, there's 24 there at the moment. They'll, they'll probably put up 60 on Windy Hill and um, the devil will be damned, you know, and that's it. And, and they'll so be we'll bigger, find out what they bigger, do. bigger and better. Yeah, they'll, they'll be the 200 meter ones, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, so. I'll just share a screen now. To, I mean, you obviously, it's difficult for people to wrap their head around, well, we had one, now two, now three, and then Windy Hill probably get upgraded to another huge project. So that'd be four around here. And then you just move down the road for a few more. But I'll just, give, just try to give you an idea what you really install for as, as we try to turn these things to, into a base load power supply. Now, I've got an image up there. I've got the Sandwell Power Station coal-fired plant food emitter. Uh, it puts out 1.4 gigawatts of dispatchable power. It can do that 24 seven. That's what it's designed for, even with maintenance. So that's what it can do, do, deliver. And that's, and basically, yeah, true, you don't need that all day, all night sort of thing. But our, Eastern, our national power grid, which is the whole Eastern States, uh, it has a big power requirement of around 37 kilowatts uh, in summer with a, with a uh, big load. So just, just roughly, and you've got to build, you're supposed to build in at least 10%. On top of that, um, so you can have outages and maintenance and things like that. So, the national grids pro you probably need 40 gigawatts altogether. Now, now to replace just Sandwell Stan Power Plant, which it's got a footprint of probably about less than two square kilometres, even even with its um, coal storage area and stuff like that. And like I say, it can, play, it can supply 1.4 gigawatts 24-7. Now to do that with wind power, right, you need 13 Cooper's Gap wind farm. Now the Cooper's Gap is the biggest wind farm in Australia, right? You need 13 of them. That's 180, uh, it's $850 million a piece. 123 turbines, and that's the biggest turbines at the moment, 3.75 mega, uh, megawatt turbines. Now, to do that, you've got 1,599 turbines. And the, and the footprint is 1,320 kilometres, and that's going to cost you $11 billion. Now, 
that doesn't give you dispatchable power. That doesn't give you 1.4 gigawatts of dispatchable power 24-7. If you want to do that, you have to add battery power. And, and what that would, would require is at least 73 Hornsdale power reserves. Now that Hornsdale power reserve is the Tesla battery that was installed in South Australia. So you need 73 of them at $172 million a piece. But you're all up for, up for $23 billion in wind turbines and batteries to replace Stanwell. And the trouble is, like you, like you said, Steve, you're going to do that every 20 years. Whereas a coal-fired power station can sit there for 60 years. So in the life of a power, coal power fire station, you are going to replace the wind power three times over. So that doesn't scare the hell out of you. And we've got to do that for 40 megawatts uh, if we were going to get down to this renewables uh, idea. So that's, that's what we're in, in for in the future. And like, like you're, 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 you're thinking of uh, Columban, well, Cooper's, Cooper's uh, gap's bigger than that. And like I say, for every Stanwell, you're going to need 13 of them. And uh, so you can imagine if we're going to replace 40 gigawatts of power with, with um, wind and solar, that's the sort of footprint we're going to have. And that's going to be massive, massive amount. So you're affected now, but it's coming to someone else's doorstep in the future. So <laughs> how are we going to warn them? Or how can we get them sort of thinking now what's coming to their doorstep? I think we have to, um, I think we have to show Ravenshall as a, the first of a long line. Um, like I want to concentrate on the, on the people of this area. I mean, there is a place for renewables. Uh, it's just not here, you know, and it's not a NIMBY thing. Um, you know, when you look at World Heritage Parks and stuff like that, that, that draws our tourism here. Uh, same as the Barrier Reef does. Uh, you wouldn't put turbines on the Barrier Reef, or you wouldn't put them in Sydney Harbour, you wouldn't put them in Morton Bay or the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast. But it seems quite, you know, it, it, it seems quite okay to just ignore uh, what's actually done on the land. Um, and that's concerning. And yeah, as you pointed out, it's a huge footprint. But to be perfectly honest, I, I don't think that the government really gives a damn if that's what it costs. If they do that footprint, they do that footprint. I think that they just, um, you know, after signing up, uh, ironically in Glasgow at COP26, um, not wanting to get political on it, but but by signing up to that, I can see that my whole area is absolutely doomed because they will just run rampant over us. And then every little town along that transmission line it's going to suffer the same. It it it, it just it, it is complete and utter insanity. And like I say, there's no jobs, there's no economic growth for the towns. So I don't know how they can justify what they're doing to these areas. Why can't they put them somewhere else that is not ecologically sensitive? There's plenty of places, but as Steve said. And, and, and you heard on Thursday, Bill, it's all about the transmission line. That's all it is. Well, while you're concentrating on the human aspect and, and, and effect on your community, I can see, see you sort of mind going in regards to what about the natural environment? And I, and I don't think people have really got understand what the actual impact is because these people have a free pass um, you got you got to got to lose a lot of environment, um, and it, and you can jump up and down. It's probably going to be very difficult to stop these things, and you won't and you won't have the Bob Brown convoy coming up to save you from a wind farm, <laughs> like they were prepared to save you from a coal mine. But do you see uh, the natural environment now is under a real threat? we don't yet know the scale of it. No. Yeah, and that's, no. And that's the, 
Yeah, so the issue is there's, there's absolutely no planning policy, no framework. There's nothing to mm. rein areas of high biodiversity. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing to rein this industry in from, from impacting on high biodiversity. What I find frustrating is you've got, what, $2 billion in the NAIF fund, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund, <coughs> which they can't seem to spend. So I don't know why some of that money can't be redirected um, to develop some sort of policy and framework for the rollout of renewables and, you know, other energy sources uh, across Australia and in particular Northern Australia. Um, and this is, this is a big issue. There is no policy framework. There's nothing, there's nothing in place to rein these developments in. Um, a couple of ideas, like Ken said, you know, maybe the transmission lines need to be redirected and put into lower ecological areas. <clears throat> I personally believe that renewables, and I think we're seeing this around the world, renewables will never ever get us to net zero. It's physically impossible. I think we might get to 60% renewables in Australia. The remaining 40% is going to be really unachievable without mass clearing, mass degradation, uh, mass impact on people's livelihoods. But also, too, there's, um, once you keep increasing the amount of renewables, the more unstable the grid comes in terms of intermediacy and instability, which means we'll then need hydro dams or pumped hydro to give the grid stability. And that has another whole suite of issues surrounding it as well. Um, the way I see it going is I really believe that we'll get to 60% renewables, same as England, we'll discover that pro uh, electricity prices are going through the roof. We're losing vast tracts of both farmland and, and, and our environment. Um, and uh, I think nuclear will have to come back onto the table. And I know Elon Musk, for example, is putting a lot of energy and money into uh, nuclear. Uh, and if you take notice, every time Elon Musk does a public presentation, he'll always dedicate five minutes of his time to the virtues of nuclear. And I think if anyone on earth has the power and the capacity and the money to develop a better nuclear system that's safer, more portable, a modular system with molten salt technology, I think he's the man that can do it. And I really believe that behind the scenes, he's putting a lot of time and effort into nuclear because I think he's smart enough to know that this is, uh, what, what's happening now is, uh, is unsustainable with, with, with renewables. It, that, that alone is unsustainable. And one thing that, to, that really does your head in is what's being proposed up in the top end, where I think Twiggy Forest is wanting to put in a big solar array to put pump electricity into Singapore. That solar array is 25 square kilometres. So it's 25 square kilometres, 25 by 25 of solar. And that energy will only pump 15% of Singapore's electricity into their grid. That's when the sun is shining. And power consumption is, is exponential. So that's going to double. So, so this year we'll supply 15% to Singapore. Next year it will be 14%, then 20%, then 5%. Then after 20 years, when you've got to replace the panels, that 25 square kilometres is only going to effectively supply 5% of electricity. But, but here's, 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 here's something for you. The whole, the whole consumption for Singapore is less than two gigawatts. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's all they, that's their, that's their peak requirement. They yep. don't, they, like we, our eastern seaboard, we need 40 gigawatts. They yeah. only need two two gigawatts. That's it. So if you only go to support, it's, if you all you got to do all that, and you only go to supply them at best somewhere about between 300, 500 megawatts of power. That's, that's nothing. That's a huge project and a lot of copper to get yeah. something. I mean, it's, it's something it's just out of this world in regards to costing for benefits. So I don't know how people do. Yeah, I don't know how that's going to work. So 25 square kilometers of solar panels, but to do that, we need to go and strip mine Cape York because there's a lot of pressure on the Scarden river up in Cape York, the most pristine of the pristine areas of Cape York, which is under a lot of pressure for silica mining for solar panels. 
So we're going to lose, you know, places in Cape York to develop stupid projects like this one to supply power to Singapore. But, but it's also, I mean, the ad additional net zero requires, it's going to require massive amounts of more ex mineral exploration, mining, metal processing, and manufacturing for all these things. I mean, one thing what a lot of people don't understand about rare metals that aren't that rare, but what it, what it is, is this to get a reasonable quantity that you need, there's so much overburden. The overburden uh, is huge. Uh, so you've got to strip out a lot of, lot of uh, the soil uh, and to get what you want. So I, I don't think people understand exactly what their future holds in regards to the mining intensity that's got to come with this renewable revolution. And uh, so it's not just the wind farms getting on next to you. It's actually going to be a lot of projects out there all across the world digging holes. And while, we, while some Western countries might have some good good procedures and um, standards, you can bet there's an awful lot of countries that don't have such good standards and will just rape and pillage their land. And that's not going to do our planet much good either. So uh, I think we may have just made a monster um, out, out for ourselves. I just want to, I just want to make a quick comment about the North Australia Infrastructure Fund. Um, Keith Pitt, the energy minister, um, was asked to provide $150 million to the Caban project yeah. uh, under the NAIF. And he turned around and said, uh, no, because I don't believe that the electricity prices that the people are paying will go down. I thought that was a great step forward. But then the state government stepped in and said, don't worry, we'll do it. And yeah, it was more about the battery. It's, it's yeah, quite think, strange. Yeah, I think what happened there with Pitt was he decided not to support Caban because there was no battery component in the development. Yep. So there was no way, there's no way there of storage, storage, storing power. It's just power. If the wind's blowing, it blows. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And Pete said, Keith Pitt said that they'd only supply NAF funding if there was going to be a battery component. The thing is, batteries are hugely expensive. And toxic. Yeah. yeah, well, uh, you will, uh, just, just, just for information, when you were talking about Hornsdale, uh, the company that's building uh, Caban, they're the ones that built the battery at Hornsdale. They're in charge of that. Okay. Mm. So, yeah, like, um, yeah, Tesla came in with the battery, but this, that company is the one that um, built Hornsdale and, and the interconnectors and all that sort of stuff. So I'm pretty sure of that. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting, interesting concept where they originally told us we were getting a big battery up here and they were going to build their own, but that seems to have disappeared into the uh, ether. Well, I think there's a lot of things jumping into, like, <laughs> another thing with local governments, you know, got Townsville sort of, you know, talking up the thing about a hydrogen hub and all this sort of thing. Um, that, that's another issue in regards to... Um, we're going to become the, the hydrogen hub of the world and sell hydrogen overseas. But you can only do that, A, after you've solved your own internal uh, supply and, and satisfy that. So in addition to all those wind and solar farms that are going to have to supply towards our 40 gigawatt um, grid, we've have got to build all this additional uh, renewables to produce hydrogen that we're going to give to overseas. And at the best, the best uh, electrolysis system only, is only 80% sufficient, efficient. So we've got to build you know, 1.2 gigawatts of uh, renewable power to get one gigawatt of hydrogen uh, value. And, and that's only in that initial phase when it's just at, at uh, one atmosphere or 15 atmospheres. And if we've got to compress it, ship it, well, then that efficiency can keep dropping down the line. 
And another thing that people don't understand is when you make hydrogen mm -hmm. and, you, and it's not, and you're not creating desal and, you know, you're using potable water, you're actually using nine litres of water or basically destroying nine litres of water for every kilogram of hydrogen you make. So you need nine, nine litres of water to make one kilogram of hydrogen. So that's got to put another impost on our environment if we're actually going to you know, lose lose that water water as well and it's not available for other things. So things just keep adding, adding on to this problem. So it's going to be interesting when all the people who have been sort of cheering on for the renewables sort of wake up and say, oi, <laughs> Let's let's pull it back here and and maybe I can ask you both. When do you, Ken, when do you think the general community's going to wake up? And for you, Stephen, when do you think the environmental uh, people uh, who are passionate about the environment are going to suddenly sort of, well, this is not working out? Do you think they'll, they'll both of those sectors will come to realization? Uh, will it be I too late? I I think that um, the population of the tablelands and the tourism or tourists that come here, the, the minute that first turbine goes up in Caban, they will see what they are up for in the future. And I think they will be turning their backs on that type of um, industrial plant when they see the disruption and, 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 and all that. I think until that happens, uh, they'll be ignorant because it certainly won't be spread across media. Uh, but I think when the first first turbine goes up at Caban, we'll see a change in people's attitudes, and that will be mid next year. Yeah, you know, I totally agree. Um, Mount Emerald, it, those turbines are far removed; they're elevated. You don't get a sense of scale. I think once that first turbine goes up at Caban. And people go, holy moly, we've got 28 of these along the entire ridge line. And then another 95 down at Shalumban, then another 20 at High Road, and then another redevelopment of Windy Hill, surrounded by these 250 metre monsters. I think uh, the local community are going to really sit up and take notice then. But from what, but your question about the environmental community, uh, I don't know what it's going to take. Uh, I've, I, I just, I don't know where it's going. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, they, they, there's, they, we're, we're still pushing for 100% renewables. I know physically 100% renewables is completely uh, unattainable without stripping the earth of all its natural resources. The only way it's going to occur is the same as Caban. What needs to happen is the people down in Brisbane and Sydney and the places that they love are going to get impacted by huge industrial scale developments and then they're going to fight save the blue mountain save the wallamai wilderness save you know save kalula national park save you know save and it's not until that point where they actually have their own favorite places threatened mm -hmm. and they're going to go okay now they understand because this is what's happened to me you know i was very naive at the start an enthusiastic supporter of big industrial renewables. And uh, I've now done it, you know, since Caban, Shalumban, Upper Burdekin, tried to do a lot of independent research. And I've, I've quickly realized that it's to go down this path is, uh, is, is unsustainable. You and also I, think that the environmental people have basically backed this um, climate change to the nth degree and given themselves no scope in regards to accepting uh, plant food emissions for at least another interim period until we've actually got the technology worked out to something better than all these intermittent, intermittent sources. And like you say, the, uh, yep. the nuclear future or something like that, yep. um, or that they're just not prepared to back off. It's just close yep. down plant food generators, and that's it. It's just got to happen and, and be damned with what we're left with. Yeah. And if we just have to deal with the problems of intermittent power or problems like that until the new generation of power comes along, uh, so be it. Yeah, I think there's a big issue too that 
you know, environment groups and I've been involved in this, have been fighting for two decades for clean energy. And now that this has dawned on us and now that we're, we're seeing it rolled out, uh, they really don't know how to respond, you know. Uh, and I'm, I'm amazed that it's taking the environmental community this long to come out with a joint policy to say, you know, we're for renewables, but it has to be done properly. And that hasn't been done yet. So you can, the environmental movement's the same as the state government. There is, it's just open slather at the moment. And uh, I, I want the environmental community to come together and come up with a joint statement. Uh, they don't need to deny renewable as, as a future as power source going into the future, but they need to come together and have a united vision on how that is to be rolled out. Because like you said, it's renewables, 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 shut down the power stations. Now that this, this moment in time has dawned and no one's prepared. Mm. Okay, we've gone well over the hour. If we just do wind up comments, um, over to you, Ken. Yeah, look, I'd just like um, everyone to consider my uh, small community. Uh, we're no different than any other community at all. You know, any small regional community, uh, we have our, you know, we have our trials and tribulations, but putting this on top of a, a very sort of difficult economic time and, you know, with, uh, with, with Corona around, we're not getting the tourists that we used to, but we are getting the local, uh, you know, regional people from Cairns and Townsville, they come up. But just think of the social cost uh, the welfare cost as you know that, that is involved in these people losing their homes the lack of welfare services uh, you know the indigenous community we haven't even mentioned them they are uh, they're being you know they have their own problems with their bureaucracy but um, yeah it, it is it is absolutely heartbreaking to see a beautiful area like this just being decimated. And and, I, and like I said, I don't think um, anyone will really, really appreciate how bad this is until we see that first turbine. But by that time, it's, it's all over. So I just want people to support us, you know, come up to Ravenshoe, you know, go out to Caban, have a quick, quick look, just come up here and have a look. And, uh, Follow the Facebook site, Keep Chalumb and Wild, um, and, uh, and also the website, um, Stop Chalumb and Wind Farm. They're both apolitical, and, and I don't want to make this about politics. It's not my thing. I'm trying to save our community from the social destruction that it's going through. And uh, just remember, the, the workers are temporary, but the pain here is, 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 is going on for a long time. All right, Steve. Yeah, look, I think, <clears throat> um, yeah, oh, look, at, I find it quite distressing that we're losing so much high biodiversity habitat. The thing that we've, over, through the conservation battles over the years, some of the places that we've been able to hang on to are the ridgelines, the hilltops, the mountaintops, because they've been inaccessible for logging or too steep for development or inaccessible for mining. So a lot of those remnant vegetation types are on the ridge lines, uh, the high elevation areas, and it's now those areas that are being targeted as a high wind resource for these industrial companies. And uh, it hurts deeply to see all these ridge lines and hilltops being carved up for wind. Uh, um, and. Uh, what needs to happen as a matter of urgency, I believe, is there needs to be a moratorium on the rollout of industrial renewables in North Queensland. So the community can take stock of where we're at, what's proposed, what's the cumul cumulative impact, and then some sort of framework on how this industry can be rolled out. Um, and I, I think a moratorium is urgently needed right now so we can just slow the whole process down. Otherwise, we're gonna have these things popping up like mushrooms and and uh, in these poor communities like Ravenshoe trying to, each, all of these communities individually having their own little battles. 
when it should be just a, a there should be a planning approach with all with all these developments and that's not being done and it's going to be every man for himself fighting their own little projects yeah yeah well that's that's one thing that sort of always worries me a bit especially the state government i mean they've got a i think they've got an outfit called regional uh regional water uh, uh, manufacturing and development sort of thing but the last thing they seem to be involved in is any planning sort of structure so it is a bit of a worry anyway gentlemen thanks very much for your time tonight if you just stay online i'll just wind up the show and we'll just have a quick chat thank you thank you if you enjoyed tonight's show please like share and subscribe to our facebook page and subscribe to our, our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I'll be back again next week. I'm still negotiating with the, the forestry uh, lobby in regards to getting on and finding out where Australia's timber industry stands in, in the world's uh, stage and uh, how, how we can uh, make better use of our resources. Until then, thanks very much.